So, thank you very much. I'm really proud, honored. And I don't know whether I deserve this award or not. I just want to tell a little bit about my journey, which my daughter told a little bit. So, uh, in mid-90s, uh, I was having a very uh, roaring anesthesia practice, freelance anesthesia practice, but uh, uh, according to the pharma companies, they know now who is the, having the, the best practices. So I was among the top few anesthesiologists in Calcutta. And uh, my day was uh, starting in the early morning and uh, going in the evening, whole day busy. So I was uh, trying to find some escape route. How can I uh, do something else? It's uh, very you know, boring, tiring, whole day doing the same things. There is nothing new in it. So doing same thing, same thing again and again. Uh, so that time I was uh, uh, inclined to do something new in the anesthesia. So that time I started, that was very, uh, in mid 90s, epidural needles, epidural catheters was uh, not available easily. Whatever the catheters, epidural catheters, needles was coming, coming from outside. But from mid 90s, exactly I cannot tell the dates, maybe 95, 96, that time, the epidural catheters uh, was available commercially in the Indian market. And uh, I started doing the epidural catheter. I started doing the painless labor that time in the mid 90s. And I was uh, reading all the books about the regional anesthesia. Regional anesthesia also that time was not popular at all. And uh, I was uh, I was giving anesthesia to my you know three or four orthopedic surgeons, and uh, they was also very helpful because regional anesthesia if the surgeon is very in hurry. You, will, you cannot, because once you are giving it epidural or if you are doing a nerve block, you have to give some time for the local anesthetic to work. So there was that much cooperate. And I was doing all the, the regional anesthesia techniques, like brachial plexus, any upper limb surgery, all the different kinds of brachial plexus. But that time, I understand that uh, the, uh, there was no nerve stimulator, there was no ultrasound. So all the te techniques was the blind technique. But still, blind technique was also available. Uh, uh, the femoral nerve block, the sciatic nerve block, the TBL nerve block. So this was uh, building my foundation later on for the coming, escaping from anesthesia to pain. So uh, late 90s, I was, uh, you know, the searching for the escape route. I was thinking what to do. I myself started some procedures uh, like yeah. epidural steroids. Again, that time, caudal epidural steroid was done blindly. Even lumbar sympathetic block. In our hospital, there was a hospital, one of the municipal hospital I was working there. So there was no CM machine that time. CM was not popular also. So they used to do the, the portable x-ray. If you can, those who are seniors can remember that nail orthopedic surgery was done, the portable x-ray. The uh, technician is going to wash the film and coming back whether it was in right position, again they are going back, another shot in that way I used to do. So I remember I used, I, uh, used to do few of the procedures, particularly lumbar sympathetic block because, you know, my surgeons that time used to do the Burgess disease sympathectomy. So one day we, after discussing with them that why to do the open so big incision, why to do go for the lumbar sympathy, let us try the alcohol neurolysis. So then started doing the lumbar sympathetic blindly with portable x-ray means uh, you know, uh, doing it, hitting the vertebral body, increasing, then have an X-ray. Luckily, sometimes it is going in the right place, luckily not, then again reposition. So this was the story in the late 90s, and uh, I was uh, you know, searching for the areas where I can learn more. So one of my teacher at that time was Dr. Dureja. I went to him talk in 2002. I was really inspired by his work. I also visited many other places. Uh, in uh, US, I was there for you know, more than a month. I actually ma mailed uh, almost all the pain clinics there, telling them I want to be there for a few days to observe what you are doing. So in that way, I was, uh, you know, the, wherever I am getting opportunity, because there was no uh, the good course, structured course, that time to learn the pain. 
So uh, today morning only, I was uh, having discussions with Dr. Jain, Neera Jain, that uh, the uh, physicians, pain physicians of present day are lucky. In our time, we have to you know, learn one procedures, and for that, I have to attend one workshops. In that way, gradually, and not only that, that time, the most important problem was how to you know, go ahead with the patient suffering from pain. If we am learning a celiac plexus block and an epidural, I try to call myself as a pain physician, which should not be. Because assessment of the patient, planning the, the management plans, and how to go ahead, that is the most important part. In those who have, was my earlier students, uh, joined in our courses and later, must have seen my transformations. Initially also I was focusing on the procedures, but later on I completely shifted. And I always emphasized on the primary job of a pain physician is not to do a procedure correctly. The most important part of a pain physician should be to understand that why is the pain and how we can give the, the best result to the patient. But that doesn't mean that you are not having a diagnosis and you should be waiting for the patients, you know, the patient will be allowed to suffer. Like yesterday there was one paper presentation, uh, so we were discussing amongst that, that many times we don't have a clue, but still we have to rule out, rule out the red flags. So in that way my, my journey started. And uh, it was a very, very difficult decision one day when I left the anesthesia and completely came into pain. And initially, my, I was having one patient a day. I was, you know, uh, the family was running by my wife's, you know, income. That time, Suspa was very small, you know. And uh, the whole day I was reading. I was thinking that, okay, I have to read a lot. If I'm leaving anesthesia, if I come to pain physician, almost always. And, uh, you know, at night also I'm reading and feeding Suspa. <laughs> my wife was, you know, the, uh, doing the, he was, uh, medical officer, chief medical officer in a government uh, you know, institution. So um, he was the whole day working. And uh, invariably, uh, you know, at night, she'll be you know, awake whole night. So somebody has to you know, accompany her. And I was, you know, my duty was to you know, read books and uh, you know, accompany her. So those are the days when you know, uh, I, my income was zero. And many people used to tell, mm, it's OK. At least that guy is, you know, have some time to spend with her you know, daughter because he's not doing anything, hardly anything. He's actually, the uh, family is run by his, his wife and he spending idle time. Uh, at least he has his daughter, that's why he's able to spend time. So those, those you know, months, years spent like that when I was, you know, having, uh, I took almost five years to you know to have some income in in pain practicing pain nowadays i this also tell to everybody who are new that you might be you know uh, able to sustain your family in 5 months but in our time when i left anesthesia and came to pain i took 5 years to you know the to to have a reasonable good income compared to my anesthesia colleagues so those hard days and gradually, gradually, you know, it is very happy to see that the pain is being recognized by the many of the universities. Uh, DM, very proud of Robi, first DM from India. So a lot of things happened and every, every other, you know, whenever the pain is doing something recognized, so we always felt happy. But still, a lot of things to do. And uh, I'm sure that these youngsters will be doing. And in my journey, I always been inspired by, not just by the seniors. I also inspired by the juniors, by their exemplary works. Lot of names are there, but here I want to speak at least one name, and that is Madan. People who know me and who was there in, in my early days, those who have completed our program, educational program in the um, uh, 2010, 15, that time, my first ultrasound machine was there in 2012. But still, I was doing very few uh, the ultrasound guided procedures. Maybe, you know, only knee case, knee, interarticular knee or something like that, plantar fascia. My journey in the ultrasound started, real journey in the ultrasound started only in 2019. 2019 and onward, I learned ultrasound mostly during the COVID period. 
uh, and I tell always to my fellows that there is no second way to learn ultrasound. Two things you need. One thing is you should be having a good uh, your anatomy software so that you can remember and rec uh, you know, recall the layer by layer anatomy. And second is you should be having a machine and a volunteer to scan, 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 and scan. So that is the, that is the way and the COVID period when everything was you know, closed down, that was the time we got a lot of time to scan, scan. And that time the transformation. But I must say that uh, I was, you know, I never hesitated to learn from my juniors as well. And I should be uh, telling this openly also, that many in my journey, I learned a lot of things from my juniors. When we are discussing in the, uh, in the OPD, in the OT, that how should be done, what should be done. And in that way, newer thoughts always used to come from my fellows. So in my journey, I was, you know, the, the I, I always tell, and that's why all my achievements, I always used to dedicate that my fellows, my students are, are my real teachers. And throughout my journey, I learned from them. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Madan, Dr. Anand, the whole organizing team, Dr. Reddy. And uh, I really don't know whether I deserve it, but I'm really overwhelmed. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Request sir and ma'am to take the front rows.